Hi there, everyone. My name is Andre Robertson Bates, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar where we're going to be talking about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. We are blessed to have a number of fellows joining the call today. Um, so we have Nate Calhoun, we have Ali um, Losselben, if I, if I pronounced that right, um, Calhoun, we have Jeff Shuffles, and we have Chris Simcock joining us as well, um, as well as Paula, who's part, also part of the team at EHF. Uh, so how we're going to do this for today is for the first maybe 10 minutes, I'm going to just give a bit of a 101 about EHF. So talking about the Global Impact Visa, talking about New Zealand. Then we'll spend most of this time with a chance to talk with our fellows to get their sense of what it actually is, uh, what it actually looks like to be part of EHF. Uh, and we also are keen to hear from you, keen to hear your questions. So we'll make it interactive as we go. So if you have any questions for us, the best way for you to do that is a Q&A box that should be down the bottom of the window that you can see. So if you click on that, if you, if you have any questions, you can write them in there. And then uh, we, we can either respond to them uh, in a discussion if they're applicable to everyone or if they're um, specialized for you, then we could answer them in written form as well. One other thing to mention is that this recording is going to be uh, it's going to be made available on YouTube afterwards, and also it's live streamed on Facebook as well. So just so that you're aware of that. Okay, I'm going to kick off. Just, just to say as well, so I'm Andre Robertson-Bates. So I lead the selection process for EHF, just to give context. Okay, so I'm just going to give a 10-minute sort of summary of, of the fellowship um, before we jump in um, to the fellows sharing their experiences of the fellowship. So we're building a community of people that are going to make global change from New Zealand, and we'll unpack what that looks like. So in this discussion, we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of what does it mean to be a fellow? What does it actually look like? So uh, here's a little bit of a kind of a thumbnail of that. So we have New Frontiers Summits every six months uh, for fellows to come and meet with other, other fellows and other entrepreneurs and, um, and change makers and government representatives in New Zealand. So that's every six months. Those who, are, or who join the fellowship, you have a welcome week retreat where you get a chance to meet all of your, uh, all of your fellows. Um, there are also retreats for particular cohorts as well, so you can have a chance to catch up with your fellows. There are regional gatherings. So for example, in Wellington, there's a monthly dinner where fellows come together. There's an online portal for people to connect, and, as well as informal collaboration, people saying, hey, you know, can you help me with my project on this or any ideas on X, Y, Z? Uh, and finally, there's support from the EHF team in terms of uh, helping you as you, if you move your, your venture and your family to New Zealand, um, or just questions around who to connect with in the ecosystem here in New Zealand. This is, oh, these are some photos from uh, New Frontiers Summit. So just to give you a, a sense of uh, people connecting and learning. We have um, James Cameron and his wife um, um, talking at one of our recent events. So a little bit briefly on New Zealand and why it's a great place to come and live and work from. So New Zealand has strong political and civil rights. Uh, it's often rated as the least, corruption, least corrupt country in the world by Transparency International. And it's the second most peaceful country in the world. Uh, and as, you, as a bonus, you get beautiful scenery. Uh, in terms of New Zealand's culture, so um, New Zealand has made maybe some maybe more steps than some other countries in terms of um, working with our indigenous communities there's obviously more more there to be um, to be worked through um, but um, it's it's something that we're um, dealing with or grappling with as a nation we were the first country to give women the right to vote uh, and, and later on um, diversity creativity and generosity and happiness and New Zealand's a great place for scaling ventures so it's first in the world in terms of ease of doing business has strong trade connections uh, and a great workforce. Now, just a couple of quick case studies on uh, ventures doing great things from New Zealand. So Weta Digital, uh, who created Lord of the Rings, Avatar, you can see a picture here. So they pretty much created New Zealand's film industry from nothing uh, with Peter Jackson and co. Xero is an online software, uh, accounting software business, which started in New Zealand and them being able to try things out in New Zealand at small scale helped them to fully develop their product. So they could go to Australia and the UK and the US and say, hey, look, here's New Zealand where we have a quarter of SMEs connected or whatever the number is and all of the banks and government. Um, so them being based in a small country helped them kind of 
demonstrate what they could do as they scale to bigger markets. And then we have Lanzatech who are creating biofuels and Rocket Lab uh, who are launching or have the capacity to launch more flights than the whole of the United States combined. Uh, and that's in a place where until Rocket Lab came along, there was no enabling legislation. So that kind of gives a picture of what you can do in terms of um, getting uh, a framework for your venture to get off the ground, uh, no pun intended. Uh, a little bit now about what we're looking for in people who are applying as well as how to get involved. Um, and then in a couple of minutes time, we'll pass it over to our fellows. Selection criteria. So we want people who have a bold vision to solve systemic challenges, uh, who have the ability to deliver on their vision, and that's an important thing. Um, and there are different ways of showing your ability to deliver on it. So being able to show you've done it in the past or the progress that you're making or the plans that you've got for your, your current venture. Um, and we look not just at, <clears throat> excuse me, startups per se, but also uh, we look at um, nonprofits or other types of things that you might have done that, that show your ability to get things done. Thirdly, your ability to connect with New Zealand is important. Uh, and that could mean moving to New Zealand permanently or it could involve, involve um, helping New Zealand ventures or investing in New Zealand ventures. But we're looking for a long-term connection that will be um, mutually beneficial. Uh, fourth, we look at people who are going to be great community members who will contribute and we can partner with over a long period of time. Uh, and then finally, people who will be good ambassadors for New Zealand. Uh, and we have these selection criteria on our apply page. Um, that's ehf.org forward slash apply. Uh, one of the pieces that we, we, this is not just a tick box exercise, but we look at these holistically. Uh, and we look at the strength of, pe of how people fit this rather than a yes, no, do they fit it, yes or no. Okay, now how to get involved. So the early bird deadline for cohort four closes tonight, then uh, New Zealand time. So we've got another, uh, whatever it is, 11, uh, just under 11 hours. Then uh, final applications for, uh, or, you know, the final deadline for cohort four is the 2nd of September. A selection process goes from September through November, December, and then we announce who's been offered a place in the fellowship. Uh, and that involves our team doing a bunch of research as well as an independent selection panel. Then the, um, then people who are from, who are internationals can apply for a global impact visa uh, once they've been offered a place in the fellowship. Then our welcome for cohort four fellows is in March. And then after that, um, the, the fellowship continues. Uh, and there's a, in terms of the visa there, um, the visa enables you to work and study and um, to invest and start up ventures in New Zealand. There are conditions there, so it's worth looking into at Immigration NZ's website. There's the option to, uh, to ap apply for permanent residency after around three years. Um, and there are conditions there, so worth looking into. Okay, so just a reminder of dates. Early bird applications close very soon in under 11 hours. Cohort four applications close on the 2nd of September and welcome week is early next year in March. Okay, uh, the, and the, the key page to look at is ehf.org forward slash apply and there's more information on the site about fees. Um, and for anyone who's looking at this video after uh, the 2nd of September, the, um, the, the fee details may change from cohort to cohort. So it's worth going to ehf.org forward slash apply. Um, to check the latest in terms of fees and dates. Okay, I'm going to um, switch gears. Uh, that was a brief kind of intro to EHF. I'm going to uh, stop the, the screen share. So now you can see the lovely faces of, of our fellows. Um, and so the opportunity for us here is to, to go into a bit more depth about what being part of the fellowship actually involves? What does it actually look like? Um, so what I, what I suggest is an opportunity for each of our fellows here just to briefly introduce yourself. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'll, I'll chip in with a couple of questions and I will also be open for any questions that uh, people on the call have as well. So if you have any questions, then you can click the Q&A box and you can submit questions to, um, to anyone, anyone here as well. Um, so maybe Maybe, um, maybe Chris, do you want to make a start? In terms yeah, of sure. Thanks, Andre. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Simcock. I'm the, the founder of a company called Impact Ventures, which uh, alongside our partners have founded and launched New Zealand's first impact investing fund, which, is, uh, which has been great to get into the market. 
So we're now out there looking for, for entrepreneurs and small business owners um, that have big growth aspirations and are, are looking to solve big problems. So we've raised just over $8 million at the time we did a first close back in February. Um, by the time we do a final close, it'll, it'll be a bit bigger than that. Um, and so we're, yeah, we're, we're just trawling, uh, trying to find um, any business that, that fits our mandate. And I have to say, from a, an investor's perspective, we've been very pleased with, with what we've seen. Um, seen uh, over 150 businesses um, in the in the year to date. Um, and just on myself, quickly, I'm a I'm a Kiwi, uh, so I've come into into the program as a as a local fellow. Um, and uh, have, have thoroughly enjoyed getting to, to meet all the other people in my cohort uh, and, and gain from their experiences from around the world. Um, do you want to nominate who goes next? Maybe we'll play a, a game of tag. I think Nate's looking eager down there. Cool. I'm uh, Nathaniel Calhoun. I split my time between um, speaking and teaching, often on behalf of Singularity University, where I'm the chair of Global Grand Challenge faculty. Um, have a bit of a focus there on the future of education, of work, of governance, um, and kind of novel business uh, approaches to business and business models. Um, when I'm not doing that type of um, teaching or program design, I'm working at uh, Code Innovation, which is a company that helps to build technologies uh, for international aid and development organizations to deliver their programming more effectively. Uh, so we try to find um, often uh, poverty alleviation programs um, or other programs that are working really well in the field but don't include technology and then try to work with the people uh, that are already expert in those programs to figure out um, what we could build them to help them do what their mission better um, and get their solution into more places more quickly. Jeff, why don't you uh, follow us up? Yeah, great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Sharples and i um, we are working on a venture that uh, is aimed at providing equitable access to clean and resilient energy. Um, the rationale for that is currently um, access to clean energy is um, often based on your uh, capacity to pay. And so um, solar and other companies tend to target those with uh, great credit, which makes, which makes good sense. Um, but what we've observed is that uh, that sometimes creates an imbalance in terms of who gets access to that energy. And then um, recently there are trends um, when natural disasters happen and they seem to happen with increasing frequency that those with um, clean energy and access to clean energy can often get back up and running faster than those that are uh, reliant solely on the grid. So there's two elements. One is equitable access to clean energy, and the other is access to more um, resilient power. So um, New Zealand's um, actually a great country to try this out in because there's a mix of um, a city, but also a lot of uh, rural um, areas. And those areas are served by relatively small grid companies. Um, which will allow us to develop programs there, which can then be scaled uh, globally. So um, with that, I will pass the baton to Ellie. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm Ellie Leslie Van Calhoun, really happy to be here. Um, my background is mostly in Africa. Uh, that's where I was raised. Most of my professional life has been there. And I've been working with social entrepreneurs and for with women entrepreneurs in particular for the last decade using technology very recently from New Zealand, which is new. So I'm a full time since uh, since the first cohort in the far north. So, of course, although I run a tech company from here that's working in Africa and working with poorest of the poor and using technology. I'm also really wanting to and embedded in learning about how to contribute up here because there are a lot of really, really interesting opportunities, particularly around uh, the future of work and how we interact with our environment and our communities that fascinate me. So um, I'm very much enjoying having chosen to be here and looking forward to the questions that people have. Thanks for that, Ellie, and thanks, thanks everyone for sharing a bit of your story. So, I'm going to kick it off by asking some questions that link to what is the fellowship actually involved. So I'll just kind of, I'll pick kind of themes of, of um, and it links to those slides before of those, those four 
um, for things that what is the fellowship involved. So, um, so maybe just welcome week. So maybe um, experiences of welcome week. How did you find it compared to what you'd expected? Uh, the, the first thing I always uh, tell people about welcome week is how tired I was by about seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night every day, just having um, incredibly, well, firstly, purposeful conversations, which was quite refreshing, but just with incredibly intelligent people who have done uh, amazing things. So every conversation you feel like you, you need to be on your game, um, just a, a great, uh, great setting to stretch your mind, stretch your, uh, stretch your kind of lens on how you look at things. Um, and analyze problems um, and uh, yeah just thoroughly enjoyed the, the networking and, and building connections with some uh, some pretty uh, talented people yeah well, um, this is uh, Jeff again one of the things that was really interesting is as an applicant you apply either with your team or by yourself and um, and you don't know who the other cohort members are going to be so when you arrive you're really kind of curious about okay how am I going to interact with folks how can I help people how will they be able to help me and um, the the capacity and sort of the welcoming of everyone to um, figure out what you're doing how they can help you is, is really cool um, but the thing that really struck me is um, as you're applying um, you're sort of applying to EHF as this organization and once you're um, once you're in, once you're part of the cohort, at least for me, I began to realize, boy, well, I am EHF, right? You are, you become a part of that greater organization. And, and so that is sort of a fantastic feeling in terms of it's not sort of a separate entity, but you're all um, part of the same, the same entity. And then that continues um, as, you know, after Welcome Week. Um, we're all sort of connected online. We connect in our in our local cities, um, and uh, and so it's a it's really a, a change in experience from I'm an individual entrepreneur with the team that I'm working with to gee I'm part of a much um, bigger whole. I would add uh, for me, Welcome Week also had a lot of um, pieces about. New Zealand culture uh, that I wasn't expecting, particularly the um, Maori culture and um, the pieces of, of, um, of welcoming us as newcomers to Aotearoa within that framework. Uh, I did not expect the vision and the values um, to, be so, to be so embedded in the structure of the week, and I thought that was really well done by EHF, yeah, so it was, um, it was much more of a community from the beginning than I expected it to be, uh, and it's become much more that every time um, we reassemble every six months now. Thanks everyone. I, I realized that I forgot to introduce one of the most important people, if not the most important person at EHF, Paola. The glue that kind of keeps everything ticking along and going, so Paola, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Yeah, um, I'm Paula, I'm part of the EHF team, uh, I'm uh, Wellington based and uh, part of my responsibilities is about fellow support, community support and team support, so it's kind of a little bit of everything which is super exciting because I'm always aware of what's going on, so probably if you reach to us I will be behind that answer. And now that we're talking about Welcome Week, I just want to say that it's a, an event that it's, we all of us take part of it in different ways and we take really advantage of sharing with the fellows and getting to know them like in a better and more like human way. And then New Frontiers is more like the business part. So it has like the both parts of getting to know each other and knowing the community and networking and every time I learn something new about the Maori culture, which is always super exciting. Kiara. Thank you. And so just adding to that, yeah, so the, the Welcome Week, um, and maybe just touching on the second cohort, which we just welcomed in April. So Welcome Week is in a, a beautiful location, which is maybe an hour out of central Wellington. Uh, it's on a, on a, a rural setting, so it's, it's beautiful. Uh, and there's a relatively small group of people like, um, you know, the, the cohort size last time was, I think, around 30 or 40 people. And um, so a chance to get to know everyone um, well and kind of go deep at a, at a personal level. <clears throat> and not so much just, hey, here's what I do. You know, here's my 
here's my LinkedIn profile, but more of a getting to know people at a, at a personal level. Uh, and then after that, uh, four days spending time with your cohort, uh, then after, after a weekend, um, with a slight chance for a break, uh, it morphs into New Frontiers, which is a gathering with uh, cohorts uh, or fellows from all cohorts, uh, as well as other entrepreneurs from New Zealand and government and other, other stakeholders. Um, so over to you all to, to, to describe rather your experiences of New Frontiers. Yeah, so I can, this is um, Jeff again, uh, maybe uh, kick it off for us personally. Um, one of the, the keynote speakers uh, was at New Frontiers this year, um, and they and they change each year. The theme is is different, or each uh, six months. Uh, but was Johan Rockström? He's a uh, notable um, climate change uh, scientist. And for for us, particularly because we're working on clean energy, and we've been um, engaged in that for probably the last uh, twenty years. It was just sort of a, a reawakening of of what's important and what um, you know what we need to get get done. So that was uh, great in terms of re-energizing, um, getting inspired, and then meeting the various folks um, who we could connect with to to start our venture off. So it was like a shot in the arm from a um, uh, from an imagination perspective and also. Um, uh, just motivation, and then also shot in the arm, just in terms of getting to know some of the local the local folks who could um, who could be be part of our our venture. And I will say the other um, really good thing, which I grew to understand over time, is um, there's a mix of internationals and and Kiwis, and incredibly important to have that mix um, because many of the Kiwi entrepreneurs have been at it for a while. Um, and they can they can sort of give you a sense of how things work uh, locally. So I think that's um, super valuable having them as as part of the cohort. Anyone else reflections on uh, New Frontiers? It's this also applies a little bit to Welcome Week, but it's it's good to know if you're coming into these events um, for the first time a large portion of the days of New Frontiers um, and Welcome Week is kind of uh, considered co-created or emergent, meaning it's not, there are big blocks of time where um, it's gonna be up to you and the other attendees to decide uh, what will be discussed um, and in what configurations, how big a group and for how long. Um, so if you're if you're from an area that already does unconferences and, and kind of rapid informal gatherings that might not be new, but um, culturally it seems that in each cohort, there are a number of people that arrive maybe thinking that it will be more of a passive intaking of information and it's, it's very active. So whatever you do to prepare yourself to share the things that concern you, the questions that you have um, will be rewarded by the structure of those events. You'll have a time to host a discussion um, and, to, and to see who shows up to, to be in that discussion with you. Mm. Yeah, just uh, I'd echo that as well. And uh, one thing that is fantastic about it is those those breakout discussions with uh, large numbers of very values aligned people. Uh, I mean, a lot of the, <clears throat> the speakers that come to, to New Frontiers are fantastic and inspiring, but you can see the, their presentations on uh, on TED Talks or YouTube um, pretty easily. So it really is the discussions that break out following those sessions that, um, that the magic really happens. Great. Well, um, we have a question from um, from one of our participants asking about what motivated um, our fellows that we have here on the call to apply for EHF compared to other fellowships. And what part of the I'm, uh, I'm happy versus other options? Sorry. I'm happy to speak to that, um, Andre. It's Ellie here. Um, so from from my side, uh, there there was an, the the New Zealand piece was the main attractor. Um, the the fact that there was something that would embed me within uh, New Zealand, within a network within New Zealand, that also shares my vision and my values, was really unique. 
Um, I, I appreciate other fellowships, but they're not usually so grounded within a place. And I had been looking to come to New Zealand and contribute to New Zealand uh, for some time, but as a social entrepreneur, really didn't find an easy way in. Uh, so I found myself having funny discussions um, with people who had immigrated to New Zealand successfully as, um, as other tradespeople who were not doing impact work saying, well, well I'm, a, I'm a banker, I'm working here, I'm a chef, I'm working, why can't you get in? You're doing all this impact work in Africa. And it just is, is really special to have found uh, a group, a community that sees the value in a global community uh, embedded in in a place uh, that shares its vision and its values in order to solve those global problems. Not that we're not going to uh, be presumptuous and try to lend a hand where we're planted and help in New Zealand as well, but it would be presumptuous to say that any of us from the outside have any idea um, how to, how to um, contribute in a meaningful way until we learn a good deal about the country that is hosting us and the culture, and, and we will indeed always be on that path. So um, from my side, from my own work, I could see the value of being based here, um, and, and I work a lot around gender issues, around innovation and technology issues, um, and I do a lot of, um, of work in that way. And so New Zealand was a sweet spot because that's already um, an industry here. That's already a community here that is absolutely thriving and a diverse community that is absolutely thriving. Any additions to that? Um, yeah, I, I um you know, we, we had visited uh, New Zealand a couple of times, so we sort of had the, uh, we had a, a sense of how uh, great a country it would be to um, live and work in. So there was definitely just a uh, sort of a pure geographic attraction there. Um, but then also, um, I think with the EHF program, as we understood initially and as we grew to understand it better, um, it's really about uh, getting, um, immigration right, if you will. And so um, Ellie had mentioned about the um, uh, embedding um, a lot of elements of uh, Maori culture and, and getting folks in the Welcome Week to understand um, to some degree uh, the impact that um, immigration would have on New Zealand. And it, it's the idea behind EHF to make sure that people understood the context um, into which they were entering and how they could be of service um, and, um, you know, how they could make sure that they were sort of creating a valuable contribution, I think was super helpful because so often when you come to a new place, those are the questions that you can't ask, you're kind of sort of concerned about, and um, EHF um, answers many of those questions and creates a safe space for you to, to ask the question. So I think um, that was sort of an initial attraction that we could see a little bit from the outside, but really once we got in was when we understood, wow, this is really teeing people up to be successful, not just in terms of, gee, I can make my business run from here, but um, how I can be success successful in sort of a larger social context and, um, you know, m not, uh, not make any grievous missteps along the way. Cool. Well, um, unless there's anything else from others to add to that, maybe if we um, skip in next to, to the topic of what is, what is informal collaboration with other fellows look like? Maybe if there are any stories you've got of, uh, of meaningful collaborations you've had with other fellows. Yeah, Ellie and I just started collaborating uh, on this call. Um, so, so, um, so Ellie was talking about a project that she was working on, and then um, and and we're in um, based in Northland as well, um, and we're obviously working with the the energy companies, um, and so. Uh, there's a possibility in terms of the work that Ellie's doing and the work that we're doing where we could um, combine and figure out, okay, how can we provide clean, resilient um, energy to some of the communities that Ellie's uh, working with? So um, those kinds of collaborations sort of um, pop up all the time. Um, and particularly because so many of the ventures are, um, well, they're all impact in venture, uh, ventures, um, but there are definitely links between all of those different um, impacts and you get to see those links as soon as you start to 
understand um, the, the other folks' work. Um, I'll share a, uh, a give and a take. Um, firstly, on the, on the give, um, in the last uh, year or so I've been in, in the program, I've had uh, calls with a number of people within uh, my cohort in particular, just around structuring ventures, raising capital, uh, legal structures in New Zealand, um, and obviously being a Kiwi and, and knowing the landscape, that's a, a really great way to, to add value to this program. Um, and to be able to point them in the direction of, of really values aligned people within the professional services networks, for example, in New Zealand or potential funding sources. And uh, that, that's been a, a great way to contribute. Um, on the take side, um, as, a, as a venture fund, um, and for me being relatively new to, to the venture landscape, I'm a um, investment banking background. Um, having uh, guys from the Founders Fund and Charles River Ventures and a number of other of the high profile VCs from around the world. Uh, it's been fantastic just to sit down, pick their brains, um, heading up to San Fran in about a month and a half's time. And, and those guys have been fantastic just lining up meetings for me. Uh, so it's great to see uh, and be able to give and take. Um, and then from the investor's perspective, also looking at uh, angles to, to co-invest and share DD and um, deal flow and, uh, the, the momentum and the, and the Vista um, stream, I have to say, has probably been slower than we, we would have liked, but uh, the wheels are starting to, starting to move now. I'd say within the New Zealand ecosystem in particular, like, so if, you're, if you come in with your project from whatever country, that's one thing. But if at the course of, in, over the course of meeting people here, uh, moving here, being at New Frontiers, if there are um, local initiatives that you get interested in plugging into or things that you start to um, consider spinning up in um, Aotearoa, um, the network is so good at connecting you immediately to, to people at great levels in government, in foundations, in education systems, in media. Um, the people that you need to talk to to kind of orient around your idea and troubleshoot right up front um, with the design of it, like who should be at the table um, do you have the, the right connections to Maori leadership when that's appropriate? How are you bringing in different stakeholders? Like the, 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 the knowledge of the New Zealand ecosystem and the willingness to um, connect you to the right people um, in those early stages of, um, of ideation around projects of any kind is great. I mean, it's, I've never found it easier to kind of test drive ideas and, and quickly refine them uh, to figure out whether they're a fit or not. It's one of the, one of the best things. Thanks for that, Nate. Um, so I've got a couple of questions from the participants, which I'm keen to cover off. First one I can take, and then the second one I'll, I'll pass it over. So first question is, um, we'd like to know if your company's considered creating global impact. Uh, I'll rephrase that. Um, I'd like to know if my company is considered to create global impact. How could I cons who could I consult about this? So in short, we're interested in people who have projects that are likely to lead to large economic, social, uh, cultural and environmental outcomes. So if you're working on a project that's going to lead to, to significant positive outcomes, then that's how we'd think about global impact. And uh, we think about it in terms of scale. So, you know, how many people could it affect, but also in terms of depth as well and also in terms of um, how how innovative the work that you'll be doing um, is um, so I hope that that answers that question there and um, next up we have another question asking how's year two and three different from year one what sort of milestones in your project should you hit for the fellowship in each year so maybe I'll just cover the, the, the milestones piece so what we expect of fellows is to be active members of the community um, people come with ideas, come with plans, uh, but we're also aware that um, things change over time. You know, plans need to evolve. So it's not that we at the EHF have, you know, you need to, you need to meet these targets, meet these milestones to continue as part of the fellowship. But, um, but we're here to help support and, and um, you know, be with you on your journey as that evolves as well. Uh, and I, noticed, I noticed that um, we're, we're relatively early in in terms of we welcomed our first cohort in uh, I think it was October last year. So I guess we're just kind of um, early stages, but any thoughts from uh, fellows here about, and we, a bunch of us, uh, three out of four of you are from thought one, uh, any thoughts around how, you know, how the fellowship has evolved and over the time that you've been part of EHF? 
That's a really thoughtful question. Um, for me, I would say it's going to be different depending on whether the fellows are Kiwi fellows um, who are already here and whether the international fellows have an intention to move permanently to Aotearoa, New Zealand, because that's a big shift. It's a big move. And that's my situation. So I've lived here um, for the last, it's going on about a year um, through the fellowship. And uh, the community of the cohort has, of course, also grown. Um, we had about half of the first cohort, like up to um, the far north after the first welcome week. And so people have had a chance to visit each other at this point, to connect, to have phone calls. We have a really active WhatsApp group where we're always sending photos and meeting up when we're in cities. So um, that sense of togetherness, uh, and again, it goes back to this idea of the shared vision and values, this idea that it's up to us to use our work to be of service to create a better world. And that is enough to bring us together because we've also found that New Zealand is also a uh, a really good way to bind us in terms of that shared community that shared culture and that shared idea of building that more beautiful world our hearts know is possible like Charles Eisenstein likes to talk about so actually to have a cohort of people who reflect that to me when I call them and say hey can I talk to you about my project and I have spoke to Chris many times um, I actually spoke to Chris on some very pivotal conversations last year deciding how to go about what I was doing um, and to know that I have a very, very um, diverse and very healthy network of people who are willing to stand by me and support me is it an exceptional privilege. Um, and I'd say I only expect that to get better because we're literally multiplying. I, I don't even know of very many people from cohort two and I'm looking forward to cohort three. So um, it's just getting started. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's pretty dynamic in terms of when we uh, between when we applied and w even Welcome Week, uh, there was an election uh, in New Zealand, and the and then um, there's so there's now a bunch of new initiatives around um, zero carbon. Um, a lot of the electric companies have sort of changed their view in a sense of uh, what it means to provide clean power, um, and so almost you know when when we were applying, we had one. Um, sort of framing of what things would look like and now um, that's that's starting to change uh, in a very positive direction um, so just in terms of you might go in with um, a project idea um, our concept hasn't changed but how we might um, execute is definitely shifting as we meet with more players on the ground um, and as the sort of overall theme changes um, and then certainly um, the support that we get from um, the folks in the cohort is is super helpful uh, just in terms of, um, you know, inspiration and seeing what everyone else is doing and, and encouragement. So um, uh, as Ellie says, I think it, it will uh, really strengthen, um, particularly as we build with additional cohorts. Uh, okay, here's a... Here's a question for the group. If you had to describe what the culture of your cohort is, how would you describe it? Like what, what is the, I don't know, what's the culture of EHF amongst the fellows? Uh, definitely supportive uh, would be my one word answer. Um, I, I'd kind of identify the shared vision. Uh, we, we all um, have uh, big problems that burn, uh, burn on our hearts that we, we want to solve. And uh, the, the other thing is it very much is a culture of action as well. I think a, a lot of these big problems are easy to talk about, but uh, actually taking steps towards trying to solve them is, uh, is one thing that everyone in the, in the cohort shares. People are pretty socially generous as well. Um, I've, you definitely see that when fellows travel to countries where other fellows still are based, um, there's a real big tendency of people to link up and to, to, to do the work of building um, friendships with each other. Like I've seen a real willingness of, of folks in the community to do that. Another one, okay, so if, if you're giving advice to anyone who joins as a new fellow, like we've got a bunch of cohort three people, um, fellows that will be welcome to the country um, for Welcome Week in New Frontiers in October, November. Any advice to people who become fellows? Like what, what should you know about how to get the most out of being an EHF fellow? 
Oh, wow. I would say before you come to Welcome Week, um, see if you can get some connections to people in New Zealand and start talking to them before you arrive. Because the network is so rich here that when you arrive, you're going to get, I don't care, I'm like a mega networker. Occasionally I meet like 100 people in a day. You are going to get overwhelmed because the quality of the curation of people who come to the New Frontiers event is extremely high. It's a definitely, um, I mean, it's a very special event. So. I, I would say be prepared for that and not, you know, do your research or, you know, do your um, you scope out your project. No, not like that. Just follow some people on Facebook or Twitter who interest you. Get to know the environment that you're coming into and ask for introductions and have some social calls with people. Because one of the things I love about uh, Kiwi business culture, and I'm just learning, but it's how relational it is, how how much it is about um, who you are in, in, a, in a community and in a network of people and what you give to that community. So as you come into that or you'll get a sense for that and be welcomed very warmly and knowing a few people and who they are and what they've been up to is always a nice way to begin to orient because you will be welcomed warmly you can expect that for sure just to add to that and i just want to say something that came up last webinar that new zealand is a small so it will be most likely that you will be able to have a quick coffee with the ceo of any company or a quick chat or something like that. Or someone will know someone that can introduce to you so you can get to know that person. So it's super easy in that way. Uh, and that's, I guess that's why uh, the, the entrepreneurial space in New Zealand is learning on relationships. And, and to that end, I would say sort of um, the quicker you let your guard down in terms of the sort of the, your business persona, um, the, the quicker you'll be able to connect with people and sort of the, the, the faster you'll kind of understand what the, um, what the program is about. And uh, any thoughts about, we've talked about, um, you know, moving to New Zealand, but, but any, any thoughts for people who are interested in moving to New Zealand? What, what should they be aware of? Like what are, the, what are the good things and the challenging things about moving moving your, your life and your work to New Zealand? Yeah, it's, um, it takes planning. It's more expensive than you would think. Uh, and also um, those expenses can be mitigated with the help of the community. So don't let the fact that it appears quite, that the, the, the cost of living can be quite high, deter you from actually making that move. Uh, reach out to people, especially the cost of living, renting when you're first trying to decide where to go. There's a lot of ways that you can land here and explore where you might want to be uh, that, that aren't like fully committing right away. They give you a chance to get to know where you'd want to land and then they also let you make the transition um, with the, the resources that you need um, because you know it, it does actually I would say the quality of life here is so high um, but if you are gonna live in a rural area or you are gonna live in a city and you'd like to buy something you just need to be aware of, um, of the economy there's also I mean a lot of people arrive and they're like oh where are you gonna live Christchurch Wellington or Auckland and it's like they've ruled out in advance uh, all the rest of the country. And there are amazing places um, scattered around Aotearoa where you could find and, and put down roots and be very accessible to a city if you need it. Um, but the other reason to consider taking some time traveling around, looking at the rest of the country is that um, the government of New Zealand is very interested in particular in helping to develop some of the areas outside of the cities. If, you're, if your initiative is gonna be of help to more rural areas, you may well find a lot more support, like people lining up with you much quicker than if you're just going head to head in a city environment. Um, so if you've got the, the, the temperament for a more, a more rural way, um, have a look. You're gonna find a really, uh, a really lively, intelligent, active, woke, liberal, uh, like a rural scene um, that you should you know, put on your list of potentials. I think there is a number of folks from from our cohort who either um, rented a um, a van or a caravan um, and traveled around just to see what was going on, um, uh, or are intending to do that as they move over. So they would sort of move land, um, then travel around, and then make a decision, and um, and kind of deciding um, uh, between you know, as Nate says. 
do I do I want to be right in the middle of the city? Um, is an hour away adjacent, but in a rural area, good? Or do I want to be in a in an area that's actually quite far from cities, and then do you know because that's the place best place to kind of get grounded in a community and do the community work? So, um, I think the the thing would be to say give yourself some time and leeway. Um, it's an opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to take three weeks a month just to look around and make sure that um, uh, where I where I land is really where I feel uh, I can I can be most successful. Um, for us, uh, we had actually um, been on holiday um, on both the North and South Island, and so we already had a pretty good sense uh, of where we wanted to be. Um, so I think uh, doing that sort of um, reconnaissance or tourism, uh, you decide, <laughs> is, a, is a good approach. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm just going to put a question out to the fellows, and then I'm going to answer a couple of questions from the Q&A, and then we'll come back to the fellows with the question. So the question for the fellows to think about it for a minute is, what did you expect of EHF when you applied back however long ago that was? Like, what were you... What was your picture of what EHF was like? And then secondly, second part of that question, how's it been different to what you expected? So just um, leave you to think about that. I'm just going to go to a couple of questions we've got uh, in the Q&A box. So one question is, are all the ventures based in New Zealand? And then the second question is, is everyone already have a venture when they join? So those two are related, so I'll kind of cover those up together. Um, so some people uh, will start a new venture in New Zealand. Some people have a venture that they built overseas that they bring to New Zealand. Um, and some, for some people, they, um, for some fellows, they're still planning on spending a bunch of their time outside of New Zealand, um, but to connect them with New Zealand through, um, you know, being here for part of the time of the year or through investing into New Zealand businesses or through connecting their networks to, um, to New Zealand parties that can help, help them um, do their mission. So I hope that that answers those questions. Um, but, Back to the fellows, what did you expect when you first applied and then how's it been different? I think one thing just to put out there is globally, um, there are a lot of fellowships that come with a certain amount of funding or a certain level of ease of access to funding. And so if you don't really read carefully about EHF and you come and you think that um, there's like a, a commitment of EHF to either give you money or immediately help you get money, um, that's not the the primary consideration of the fellowship. It's much more about a community of action, about willing to make introductions and, and ally with you on the on the mission that you're on. Um, so just make sure that you understand it is not like a cash based or commitment to support you financially type fellowship. Um, that's not something you want to be confused about. I've um, previously lived in um, multiple countries and and uh, sort of on a long-term basis and then actually gone through uh, immigration uh, process to the US and um, I I sort of my one of my expectations was gee how hard was the visa processing going to be um, and how um, sort of uh, onerous that might be and I was blown away with sort of the welcoming of the of the folks from the um, from the visa office, um, both just in terms of applying for the visa, answering questions, and then also uh, during welcome week, they came out, um, talked to us, and um, it was just a a very uh, welcoming experience, which uh, may not be the case for all other countries. So that was, I think, a big a big uh, switch for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't really have any expectations coming into it, to be honest. I, I got attracted by the, the colour of the people who were uh, establishing the, the program and, and that kind of drew me into it. Uh, the, the thing that's been probably most surprising is um, the, the quality of the people, uh, I'd say, and I, I don't mean that in terms of what they look like on paper because you, you obviously expect that to be a, a very high standard, but as actual people, it's um, not a professional feel amongst the, the cohort at all. It very much is a, a guard down uh, friendship type community. Um, and the way we interact uh, very much is on that, that sort of level rather than it being a professional networking type, uh, type community. 
Could, um, could anyone give any specific, uh, sorry, not any, um, any thoughts around how they've seen fellows helping each other out at a personal level and without giving specifics or names or anything, but just, you know, and it kind of a, an archetypal example of, um, of how, how people help each other out at a personal level. Sure. Um, I mean, e- even in our, our last cohort uh, get together, we, we were designing the agenda for the day on the fly. Um, and there were a number of people who put their hands up to, to effectively have their business or the project or the adventure, whatever, whatever it was, uh, broken down and critiqued. And they spoke very honestly about the challenges they were facing. And in the room with them were 10, 15 people, many of whom have faced challenges similar to those before. So were able to uh, sympathize uh, and add value to, to their business, um, not only in kind of a, a technical capacity, but also at a personal level about the, the roller coaster you face when you're taking on big challenges like that. Um, and there, there's been plenty of examples uh, like that. Yeah, I think the safe space discussions during uh, Welcome Week, um, where it was sort of small groups, maybe six people, and people could share their challenges and a lot of, and some folks had sort of real problems they were working through real time. And they almost felt like, gee, I can't um, take the time to go to Welcome Week. I've got to fix this thing that's going on with my with my business. And, and coming there and their reflection was, gee, it's, it's great just to be able to speak candidly to people who, um, who care, who can um, empathize, who can provide advice. Um, and that really helped them through sort of think through their, um, their particular challenges. And they basically said, you know, I was, I was better off spending the time at welcome week um, with other fellows thinking this through than trying to grind through on my own um, back at, um, you know, back in their, in their venture. So just a, a note to participants for any other questions you've got. We've got about eight more minutes before we need to wrap up the course. So if you have any more questions, feel free to pass them through and we'll put them to the fellows. One thing I'm keen to ask before that, however, is um, just about what it's like for people, including their life partners with them um, as part of the fellowship. So a um, bunch of people who become fellows um, come with their family, come with their, their life partner. And um, um, so just any, any reflections from what people have seen of bringing or connecting in their family because um, for a number of people um, thinking around how, how a move will fit for their family is an important consideration as well. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite fortunate. So my, my partner is actually um, a, partner in the in the venture as well um and has worked in a a very similar space so um for us it's a pretty natural um fit uh we're based in san francisco and we actually saw one of our fellows just by happenstance um on the streets of san francisco passing through and um he and his wife and two daughters were were moving and then later i saw them at san francisco in a national airport and they had these big giant bags <laughs> and, and a look of excitement and concern on their face. So <laughs> I think, um, um, but you know, they've, they've really been supported by EHF in terms of the move where they're going to stay when they land. And then, and then, um, you know, looking for um, how to move into the community. So I think they took probably four or five months to figure out their their move plan and um the welcome week the ongoing relationship with other fellows particularly the the kiwi fellows was um was really helpful in in helping them get comfortable uh about the move it was it was really noticeable in cohort one and i heard the same from cohort two that the the invitation to a fellow to, to bring along his or her partner is it's incredibly sincere and it's incredibly comprehensive. It actually verges on like an expectation of, of real engagement. So like if, you're, if your partner comes along to the, um, to the welcome week, um, they're going to be included in 75% of the activities as if they were a fellow. Um, they'll, the, the cohort will end up knowing a great deal about them. And in the small number of instances when they're not included, 
they'll have a parallel activity with other partners that's also well thought out and of, of high value. Um, so if anything, partners that are thinking, oh, I can just kind of float in and out of the event will be surprised at how, how genuinely they are pulled into the community. Um, and the community is also super kid and, and uh, child positive. Like you'll, you'll see children of different ages like floating around. Uh, so if that's a concern or something that's important to you, you should know that the, there's a real child friendliness in the, in the community as well. I just want to add, so someone in, in Zoom raised their hand. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but if, if you have a question, then, um, then um, add it into the Q&A. And um, one, one other question for the group is, why New Zealand for you? So, uh, Chris, that seems an obvious one for you because you're Kiwi born and bred, but, um, but for, for the rest of us, you know, why, why come to New Zealand as opposed to all the other places that you could connect with? As somebody who works and continues to work in Africa, um, which is where I think we're really going to see amazing growth and progress and amazing things happen over the coming decades, uh, New Zealand to me is also one of the places in the world that has so much lined up for its future um, that is really putting it in a space to be able to affect positive change in a really unique and interesting way. Um, for me, that's because of the what it's doing in its legal system and in its government in terms of protecting the rights of nature, in terms of the um, progressive things that it's doing for survivors of intimate partner violence, for uh, just general cool stuff. And um, there, it's a, a very much like a bicultural society, I would say a multicultural society now, but legally, um, because of the Treaty of Waitangi, there are some very interesting things in New Zealand that if you're interested in social justice, if you're interested in restorative justice, and you're interested in doing social business and kind of social projects that work within an indigenous framework, that can happen here in an amazing way. And um, coming from the US, as you can probably tell by my accent, that's not the case. Um, a lot of the times the, the government is not set up in a way to be able to work with, um, with, with indigenous people. So if that is something that's interesting and, and, and it is to me, it's um, part, of, part of my work and, and my service, this is an amazing opportunity to come and learn uh, and to inform my own work. So that's what, what it was for me. Also, giving the rights of nature to, a pl to places that New Zealand is such a leader. And so because innovations can scale from here very easily, I wanted to be a part of that. Any other thoughts on my New Zealand? If not, that's okay. Well, oh, no, no. I'm, I, that had been so eloquent, I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to even add to it or attempt to, but I think for us, you know, apart from just um, uh, liking the country and the people, one of the things that was very apparent was the ease of doing business uh, in New Zealand, just from the few transactions that we that we um, did, and um, and that that was sort of um, um, it just felt really good to be able to get business done uh, relatively simply and straightforward. Um, so that was, that was an attraction. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're almost at the hour, so I'm gonna wrap up the call now. Uh, but I'd just like to say thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Uh, and just a reminder as well, uh, linking back to what I mentioned earlier in the call, uh, that the early bird deadline for cohort um, four closes uh, in, now it's about 10 hours um, and the applications for cohort four close on the 2nd of September. Um, so if you're, if you think it would be a good fit for you, then we encourage you to apply. Um, and um, once again, thank you for making the time.